Good evening, friends. Welcome to Pendle Hill. My name is John Meyer, and it's my honor and pleasure to welcome you to another first Monday, our first Monday of 2019, a series of lectures this year on the theme of liberation. Before I introduce tonight's speakers, I would like to ask you to go ahead and take a handout with additional resources that Pamela has prepared for this evening that are seated, that's on the uh, settee as you come in the door. And uh, as usual, I would like to remind folks that not only are we the folks in this room, but we are being live streamed to others around the country. And for those people, I'm going to flash at the very end of the lecture a PowerPoint screen on the screen behind you so that you at home will receive the list that um, Pamela has prepared. So be patient with that. Um, as many of you know, I also like to put my commercials up front while I have everyone's undivided attention and a great deal of expectancy. In addition to uh, our having Pamela with us this evening, we're going to welcome Laura Boyce, a member of Providence uh, Monthly Meeting and the Associate uh, General Secretary of the American Friends Service Committee for United States Programs, who will be speaking to us both of her experiences um, interviewing and talking with um, Central American migra migrants who have reached the U.S.-Mexico border, as well as the campaign that American Friends Service Committee has been instrumental in forming an interfaith coalition called Love Knows No Borders um, that has undertaken uh, various witnesses around the country, including one in which our executive direct, our education director, Francisco Burgos, took part in at the border at San Diego on December 10th. That will be Monday, January 14th, here again in the meeting room. It will be live streamed as well, and it will again be 7.30 to 9. Then for next month, first Monday, we have another member of Providence Friends Meeting. Um, many of you know Dr. Samuel Lemons, who's a professor at uh, Newman University, who will be speaking on the healing power of telling truth about the past. Um, as we well know, what Faulkner wrote, that the past is never dead, it isn't even past. And he's going to be talking about the intergenerational trauma that comes from a lack of truth-telling in our country, and then how healing can take place from unearthing, and I call it writing. He, I would say he'd probably put a W-R-I-T-I-N-G, but I put it as writing history. In his case, unearthing the story behind a tremendous, a, de a, a nationally publicized murder of a woman and the totally unfair framing of a young African man who is young African boy who was put to death in the electric chair, the youngest person to be executed in Pennsylvania wrongfully. Um, that will be f the first Monday in February, February 4, here in the barn, 7.30 to 9. It too will be live streamed. So it's tonight my pleasure to introduce to you someone whom you all know already, it seems, many good friends of Pamela Haynes from Central Philadelphia Monthly Meeting, who has spent a lifelong uh, journey of exploring economics from the standpoint of those uh, as a social worker, child care workers, social activists, Quakers, Ugandans, urban farmers. She herself is not an economist. But if you read her book, along with Ed Dreeby's, Toward Right Relationship with Finance, you will find that the things that seemed so foggy and mysterious, wrapped in mystique, are laid out plainly with Quaker values underlying it. And I strongly recommend it. It is available for purchase afterwards if you are interested. It's also available from Amazon or at your local bookstore. 
So I would, and in, in addition, I have to put in a plug for um, one of P Pamela's more recent Pendle Hill pamphlets, which is called Money and Soul, and which f formed the framework for a book that was just published called Holding Up a Copy, Money and Soul by Pamela Haynes in Quaker Quicks. So I'm sure that for those of you who have enjoyed Money and Soul, the elaborations that Pamela has put forward in that volume will be equally valuable for you. So I would like to invite friends into a period of reflective silence as we hold Pamela in the light and she prepares to speak to us this evening out of the silence on money, debt, and liberation. Thank you. So, money, debt, and liberation. What a topic. Definitely not for the faint of heart. So I want to start by thanking you for coming. Personally, I find this topic incredibly stimulating, interesting, and worthwhile. But I also remember reading my college economics textbook as a way to go to sleep at night. Yikes. So I hope you'll hang in. And remember that we're not droning on and on about economics, I hope. We're trying to imagine a big, important um, new thing together. So I'll do my best to be as fully present as I know how in all my excitement and my occasional wonkiness. And I hope you can do the same. We'll also have a brief halftime break where you'll be liberated to have your own minds to work. I know it's sometimes hard to listen and listen and listen. So the official topic is money, debt, and liberation. But another thread is imagination. It may be hard to think of money and imagination in the same breath. But I'd like to propose that imagination is a, uh, provides a critical pathway to unblocking a key bottleneck in our society. So here goes. It has been said that it is easier to imagine the end of life on Earth as we know it than a new economic system. It is easier to imagine the end of life on Earth as we know it than a new economic system. And that is a lethal failure of the imagination. You think about it, an enormous amount of cultural effort and resource has gone into inviting us to imagine the end of life on Earth as we know it. Think of all those movies whose plot lines are centered around dystopian futures, all those sci um, science fiction stories, and now with more science and less fiction, all the um, disaster scenarios around climate change. We're really weighted down by these images of how it has to be, kind of blanketed by a heavy sense of inevitability constricted by lack of options. It really oppresses our spirits and it hinders our faithfulness. It's like the pathway to doom has been cleared out before us. But where's the pathway toward an economy that works for everyone? Our imagination doesn't carry us very far in that direction. So, so tonight I want to consider some myths about our economy that constrain our imagination and and hinder our ability to be faithful in all aspects of right relationship. My hope is to liberate us from that narrow story of inevitability and free us up to imagine a new thing. More specifically, my goal is to look at one aspect of our economy where lack of imagination is all but complete, and that is our money system. So I say, after all, why mess around? Let's go for the hardest thing. And in a way, it would be easier to spin out a vision of how we could manage our money system in an alternate universe. But I want to start right where we are 
in all the mess and complexity of our current system as it currently works and try to open up a path forward from there. And what, you might say, does this all have, with re have to do with religion and faith values? Well, that great economic thinker, Quaker economic thinker, John Woolman, invites us to look at the connections among things. He might, invites us to recognize chains of oppression, to look for the roots, and as people of faith, to find a place of integrity to stand in all of our affairs. Whenever I'm following John Woolman, I feel like I'm on solid ground. Still, since there may be no area of our lives that has been more totally appropriated by secular thinking than our money system, it may seem like a stretch to see this as a faith exercise, and perhaps a painful one. But I'm excited about that stretch. I'm excited about getting faith muscles that may have gotten a little atrophied, kind of working again, so that we can speak our truth more boldly in the world. So in the midst of what may seem like a wholly secular topic, I invite you to listen for themes of integrity and right relationship. I'll be talking about four big myths. The myth that money is real, that debt is just debt, that growth is good, and that finance is for the experts. Then I'll end with some ways of imagining a new thing in the way our money system is organized and steps that we can take toward liberation. So, let's start with the first myth, that money is real. In ancient Mesopotamia, I've learned, little clay tokens indicated that you had paid your, gra your um, grain taxes to the king. People discovered that these tokens had value and could be traded. In the Middle Ages, Goldsmiths kept people's extra gold in exchange for promises, and the promises began circulating as a more convenient form of money. When the goldsmiths began creating more promises than they had actual coins in their vaults, they became bankers. In 1694, the Bank of England was created on this model. It acquired a monopoly on money creation from the king providing funding for his wars with France after his treasury was exhausted. And this was the beginning of the monetary system as we know it. Now, we would prefer to think about money as real. We know the feel of a quarter or a $10 bill. We know what it can get us. And there have been times when people have actually traded gold coins. And for many decades, when we were on the gold standard, our money was backed by bullion that was sitting in government vaults. But money in the bank, where most, the vast majority of our money is kept, was not so secure, as could be seen by countless local back bank runs in the 1800s, the Great Crash of 1929, 2008. And since 1971, when we went off the gold standard, all that secures the value of our money is our shared trust that the system will keep working. It's not very much, our shared trust that the system will keep working. And that system is centered in private banks. Except for the coins and the currency that are minted and printed by the government, the vast majority of our money is produced when private banks make loans. Now, this may seem surprising. Conventional economic theory says that banks are mere intermediaries. They only make loans on the basis of the deposits that they've previously taken in. But there's no evidence that that's actually how it works in real life. There's a more nuanced theory of fractional reserve banking, which says that since not all depositors are gonna want money at the same time, it's okay for banks to lend out a little bit more than they have. But it turns out that their vaults are essentially irrelevant. If a bank has reason to believe that a loan will be paid back, they have no need for reserves. By making a loan, they create money. They write numbers in my bank account, and I have new money to use. They write numbers in the, their books indicating what I owe, plus interest, of course. And we'll get back to the interest. Um, so most money that circulates in the economy 
is created when private for-profit banks make loans. The government still plays a role. In addition to printing currency, as could be seen in the response to the crash of 2008, um, where, did they, where did all the billions to bail out those banks come from? Well, the government, the Treasury authorized the Federal Reserve to make credit available to the failing banks. So they did the same thing. They wrote money and they wrote numbers in their accounts saying, we've, we've created these loans and the banks wrote, had numbers in theirs. So new money was created. And we'll come back to the Federal Reserve. We're gonna circle back to the Federal Reserve several times. So money is not a thing. It's not backed by gold. In the language of one financial thinker, Robert Hockett, it is backed simply by the full faith and credit of the government. And part of that backing comes with public insurance through the FDIC of our private bank accounts, public bank backing of, of that money. Our money system is better thought of as a social construct, an arrangement of public trust, perhaps even a public utility. Now, understanding that it's an arrangement of public trust can really help free up our imagination about possibilities. There's nothing immutable or sacred about how it works in the current form. What is immutable and sacred, one could argue, is the importance of public trust. If we think of money as a utility that allows people the wherewithal to acquire the things they need, at least we're on solid ground. Now, there are many experiments on a small scale in this direction, community barter systems, local currencies, and on a larger scale, credit unions, where people are some members are sometimes lenders and sometimes borrowers. We can build on these and begin to think about how our money system could be organized on a larger scale, perhaps in a very different way to better serve our shared well-being. Hopefully, we can be freed from that myth of narrowly constrained options and liberated to imagine a new thing. The second myth I want to look at is that debt is simply debt. Now, debt, by definition, is not a bad thing. Paying a little interest to get access to money that will allow more in the future, as an individual or as a business, can be beneficial to all parties involved. It can make sense to take out a small loan to have the means to produce a big harvest. But what about a sharecropping system? that is organized to keep people in debt? What about student loan debt that constrains the choices of young people for decades to come? What about the credit card companies that make the most off of those who can least afford to pay? What about payday lenders who do the same but even worse? What about mortgage rates, mortgages with interest rates that pull people in and then balloon out of control? Taking out a loan when there's some reason to believe that it can be paid back is very different from getting caught in debt that has no hope of being repaid. Particularly when the lender, when the goal of the lender is to keep you in debt so that they continue to make a profit. In the past, all major religions took a strong stand against usury, this charging of exorbitant interest to those who could least afford to pay. Morality and faithfulness call us to join them in protest, to stand in clear condemnation of such debt, which is now oppressing more and more people. There are many steps that can be taken toward liberation in the short term, and I want to name a few before moving on. There's private refinancing. People with money to invest can buy up other people's high interest debts and refinance them at much lower rates. It's a pretty exciting thing, I think. There's, op there's opportunities to rein in predatory lending. There's some motion currently on better recognition of payday lending institutions, of usurious credit card policies, and the worst of the for-profit colleges that are actually in the business of making money off of student debt. It behooves us to keep track of such liberatory efforts and and perhaps play a role in them. 
Then there's strike debt, which was an outgrowth of Occupy Wall Street. It was an initiative where people took the innovative strategy of buying up health insurance debt from debt collection agencies at pennies on the dollar and then soliciting donations to simply buy it, buy it, pay it off. How might such a strategy be replicated? And debt jubilee. Now this concept has the aura of quaint biblical antiquity, irrelevant to the present if it ever worked in the past. When I first heard about it, I was enchanted and then um, found it pretty unlikely. But I learned that it actually had, did take place in real life, at least sometimes. And the place that I've learned about is um, in Sumeria. That new rulers in Sumeria routinely erased everybody's debt when they came to power. That was just the practice. And there was, there was two good reasons to do this. One was that it brought the playing field back closer to, to uh, level so that there could be, people could be more productive and pay taxes. And it also kept private individuals and groups from amassing too much wealth and power that might um, create competing sources of power. Ah, but that was a very long time ago. Could debt jubilee be practiced today? Well, in the year 2000, over $100 billion of debt from 35 impoverished countries was forgiven by the G8 nations. The debt was simply written off their books. $100 billion was written off their books. Most of us never even heard about it, and there was certainly no tremors in the economic system as a whole. Debt jubilee. It could also be argued that the great bank bailouts after the 2008 recession were a form of debt jubilee, though um, probably not what the Israelites of the Old Testament had in mind. On a side note, I find it instructive to look at how these bank failures were managed in different countries. In Ireland, the government took on the failed bank's debts as their own, and through taxation, those debts were paid off through individual citizens at a rate of about $9,000 per person. In the US, the government bailed out the banks by printing new money through a, a um, process that's called quantitative easing. In Iceland, they just let the banks fail and then took a series of measures to offer debt relief to the individual citizens. So there's all kinds of things that can be done to ease the oppressive burden of debt. But none of these strategies liberate us from the dynamics of debt creation that are baked into our economic system as it currently functions. They either take the edge off the excesses and the cruelty of those who profit from the indebtedness of others, or they offer a temporary clean slate to individuals and, and countries but who are then returned to a system that depends on interest for its lifeblood. So this is a hard one. Let's think about this a little bit. Right at this moment, there's a certain amount of money on the books in banks, out as loans. That's the money that's circulating in the economy, along with some bills and change. And that's what's available to pay back people's debts. It's circulating, it's around. But to pay back people's debts with interest, to have enough money to pay back both the debt and the interest, more money needs to be available in the economy than is currently there. So how can that happen? More loans and more debt. With more debt on the books, more money is circulating and some of that money can be used as uh, is available to pay, pay back the additional interest, except that those debts have to be paid back with interest as well which means yet more debt. Thus, the dynamics of debt cannot be separated from the dynamics of interest. And our liberation will require some kind of a break in that cycle. Think about this as an opportunity to imagine a really new thing. But before we go on further to explore the interplay between debt and interest, and the connection of both with growing income inequality and environmental destruction, I want to pause a minute to consider the difference between private debt and public debt. 
when I am indebted, usually to a bank, I have to pay that money back, or there can be some pretty severe consequences. When a nation holds a debt, in contrast, those negative consequences don't automatically follow. We wring our hands about the size of the debt, but life goes on. Indeed, sometimes the government really needs to spend money into the economy in order to uh, get us through hard times, like the Depression, World War II. That spending was part of what got us out of the Depression, and the, the stimulus spending that followed the recession in 2008 was critical in generating new jobs and getting the economy back on its feet. So again, with money as a social agreement, debt can sit on a government's back, on a government's books for years. It's just numbers, nobody's trying to get repaid. The big problem that I see with that national debt is the interest. Under our current system, set up with the, national Res the Federal Reserve in 1913, this debt is held by private banks. Again, we're coming back to the Federal Reserve one more time. Thus, taxpayer money is constantly funneled out of the public treasury to private banks to pay the interest on the public debt. It could be different. In Canada, for example, from 1938 to 1971, the Canadian Central Bank created money by spending it directly into the economy on infrastructure, on health care, on public works. Then a change in government policy resulted in a switch to borrowing from private banks. So since 1971, Canada has paid billions of dollars in interest to private banks which could otherwise have been available to meet public needs. Well, is that the worst thing? The need to pay interest can just be absorbed into a growing economy. And that leads us to our third myth. That, that is the myth that growth is good and more is better. Okay. So, for several hundred years, the uh, West has been in an expansive mode. This has been true for so long that it almost seems normal that expansion is just the way things are. It's hard to conceive of an alternative. When settlers came to this country, they saw what appeared to be vast, empty frontiers full of fertile, unworked land. And despite how tragically flawed that perception was. It's one that's, that's very deeply embedded in our culture. And then the discovery of fossil fuels opened up all the potential of the Industrial Revolution. Fossil fuels appeared to allow us to grow and grow and grow without any consequences. Continual growth just seemed our destiny. It's only gradually dawning on our consciousness that the land wasn't empty that the stored sunlight in fossil fuels isn't finite, that there's no way to throw things. The idea of infinite growth should give us pause regardless. So long as we're talking about physical growth, it's a, the concept is inherently flawed. Just think about our children. Would you want them to keep growing as adults at the rate they grew as children? I don't think so. And we would do anything to keep those cancer cells from growing. So speaking about economics, having a requirement for growth baked into our economy through that debt interest dynamic has three particularly pernicious consequences. The first is that it breeds inequality. Those with excess money are in a position to lend with the result that they accumulate more from the interest. Those with insufficient money fall into debt. Having to pay interest, they end up with less. The money of those with less flows steadily toward those with more. This works not only for individuals, but for nations as well. Nations that have been impoverished by colonialism not only ship out raw materials to have value added abroad, but also debt payments, which also often make up a significant portion of their budgets. 
Now, government inter intervention can help equalize the situation, and it's played a critical role in the past. We mentioned debt jubilee, 100 billion. I keep 100 billion. That was um, taken off the books in the year 2000. Tax policy is another common tool. In the US, in the 1950s, if you made more than $250,000, the tax rate on that income was, and hold on to your seats if you don't know this, 91%. 91%. So the idea was that if you made $250,000, that was just about enough. It's a couple of million now with inflation. I can't remember the exact figure. So it logically followed that the rest should go to meet shared needs. Mortgage assistance in the 1930s and the GI Bill after World War II were other equalizers, although they were also places where racism re reared its ugly head, and that's one of the significant reason why black people have struggled to accumulate wealth in our country. But absent government intervention, we end up in the situation we're now in with growth causing wealth to flow steadily to the top. It's just the way our economic system works. Politicians tend to like it. If the economy keeps growing, tough issues like inequality and maldistribution can be glossed over by a promise of more for everybody, although that promise is wearing increasingly thin. Both a very, very painful situation and a hopeful sign for liberation from this constraint on our imagination. The first consequence had to do with inequality. The second pernicious consequence involves our souls. For the economy to continue to expand, markets have to continually grow, and citizens need to be recast as consumers. We need to be programmed to always want more. We know about this. The temple has been taken over not just by the money changers, but by the economic system as a whole. As a society, we've become worshipers of mammon because of the requirements of growth. So faith, creativity, and power are called for in abundance to imagine a new thing here. The third pernicious consequence involves our precious and finite biosphere. Our current methods for Creating stuff involves extracting raw materials, using fossil fuels to make new products, and then throwing them away, creating pollution and waste in every step along the way. What we've done already is stretching the limits of the biosphere to the breaking point. Yet, economic growth requires more. We're beginning to face up to the reality that the Earth cannot absorb more of the impacts of economic growth and remain hospitable to species such as ours. Our much-touted growth in GDP currently measures progress toward catastrophe. We would be smarter to measure not how much money is flowing through our economic system, but how well our people are thriving. But it's a challenge to think well about a new ways of managing our economy when our interests are so deeply entangled with this one. Going back to debt, the idea of liberation from entanglement with, with debt seems pretty straightforward. Though we may not know just how to go about it, somehow it's consonant with our worldview and our values as Quakers. To me, a much more challenging and dissonant question is what it would mean to take on the project of liberation from interest. Yikes. So here's a story from Philadelphia Yearly Meeting Sessions in 2014. Um, I know that some of you know it already. After going through painful layoffs and belt tightening following this recession of 2008, we finally got the good news. Spending was stable, resources were up, income was showing a tendency to rise, if the stock market would just continue to grow, we could anticipate more reassuring financial statements for years to come. If the stock market would just continue to grow, what a paradox. The health of our institutions 
and the security of our old age, with all of us investing in um, uh, all those things, are now inextricably linked with the health of our financial markets. So we will be secure, secure, only if we tie ourselves to a system that endanger, endangers equality, the biosphere, and our souls. So this puzzle led to a book writing project where four of us worked to get our heads around how that has happened. We researched plausible and historically grounded alternatives, particularly regarding finance and retirement, and imagined new forms of durable economic and social security that were not linked to the need to make, to earn interest on investments. Now, I could talk all night about everything we learned, but instead I'll just direct you to this book published by the Quaker Institute for the Future and available for sale outside afterwards, um, toward a right relationship with finance, interest, debt, growth, and security. One exciting outgrowth of this work is a growing conversation among local Quakers about directing our institutional investments toward community impact. Not a complete solution by any means, but one step along the road toward liberation from the financial markets. We've arrived at halftime. So let's, um, let's just take a little pause. Don't get up and go to the bathroom, but if you want to turn to your neighbor, share a thought or a question, or just get a little relief from having to take in information, in just a couple of minutes, I will take us into the third and fourth quarters. Exactly. Feel free to talk to somebody next to you. Okay, let's get going again. I realized if we don't spend a lot of time now, we maybe have more time at the end for questions. So, so by now it should be fairly clear that we can't trust the experts to get this one right, which leads to the fourth myth, that finance is for experts. Remember how all the major religions took a stand against usury? They said it just wasn't moral but morality has no place in our economic system these days. As a matter of fact, economists in the late 1800s worked very, very hard to create a, a hard science that could be quantitative and value free. They used physics as a model, and my father, who was a, an economist, used to call it physics envy. So traditional economics, as taught in college, is based on complex mathematical models, and for complex mathematical models to work, what you have to put into them has to be easily measured. So you have to define human beings as having a single-minded interest in acquisition, for example, and you have to not ask too many questions about more fundamental well-being that can't be um, translated into data, numbers. But if the very foundations of the theory are questionable, where do we turn? 
And since it's not easy for any of us to think in this area, I want to share a little bit about my search. As someone with minimal economics training, I did take an econo economics course in college, but I'm not an economist. So my search for truth among the mires and thickets of economic theory. I'm learning that classical economics is now limited almost entirely to the classroom, and it's fiercely protected there. Many of its adherents seem more intent on protecting their expertise than engaging with the real world or with truth. An economist at a college in New England was recently fired for teaching alternative economic theory along with the classical economic theory that he was required to teach. As a matter of fact, there's a growing movement among stu economic students around the world to be liberated from this straitjacket of classical theory. No mainstream economist predicted the crash of 2008. As hard as it may be to believe, the models that these economists use do not try, even try to account for money or debt or banking. They call that the invisible veil that lies on top of the real stuff. So problems with too much money at the top chasing for ways to make more and the resultant bubbles and instability are just not part of their models. Looking beyond the classical economists, it can still be hard to know who to trust since everybody brings their thinking with very convincing sounding, sounding statistics, even if they're op, you know, op, bringing forth totally opposing points of view. So I've been searching for clues beyond the data. There's this guy who is really strong on the role of money in the past as a way to track and manage debt, going back to that ancient, the ancient Sumerians and their clay tokens. But I listened to a talk that he gave, and there was a question about what to do about student debt in the present. And his answer was basically, there's nothing you can do. Students are screwed. And I thought, well, I can't follow this guy in the present and the future. Then there was another guy from Australia who was really, really good on debt. And he was one of the few to predict the crash. And I was very impressed. And then I heard him say that he was pretty cynical about the climate crisis. Since he couldn't fit it into his models, he just had to hope that some massive, I would say magical, technological solution would, be, would come. So there's another one I can't follow. I was really hopeful about this guy. Then there's a new school on monetary theory, which shines a light on some of the things that I find pretty compelling about the importance of government being able to create money. But, the fact that they're led by a former hedge fund manager who lives in an undisclosed undisclo location in the Caribbean just gives me pause, to say the least. My current favorite is a guy who got into the field by hanging out under a bridge with some homeless folks to try to understand their sharing economy, and then lived at Occupy Wall Street when he wasn't working at a bank during the day. So we need to be discerning in who we follow. Ultimately, the question about whether to trust them may not come down to whether their statistics are more compelling than the other person's, but whether they include us all in the picture. Are they talking about our common wealth and our common well-being? Do they get the connection between the economy, the biosphere, and life on Earth? There is a small and growing and vigorous group of economists who are doing this, standing on the shoulders of some of the great economics thinkers of the past, including our own John Bellers, who I'm excited about, John Woolman, and Kenneth Boulding. Boulding is the one who popularized the concept of the spaceship Earth, a pivotal image to help us understand the con the, um, that the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the biosphere. I love that phrase. The economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the biosphere. But these folks need our help. To build an economic system that works into the future, we have to find a way to thrive in, this, in a steady state. Like maturity, like children who stop growing after they get to be adults, but they continue to thrive. There's gotta be a way to do that in the economy, right? 
so what's needed most in the marketplace these days is not new, new stuff, but new ideas about organizing our economy. And that requires us to be out there, sharing our priorities about what matters, our commitment to our neighbors, and our faith values. We can't just leave it to the economists and the politicians. And there's a precedent among Quakers to build on here in how we've applied our peace testimony over the years. We don't leave peace to the self-proclaimed experts in the government and the military. We bring ourselves and our values in. We proclaim what we believe, even if there isn't a lot of evidence of it existing in the present. We have to do the same with these tough issues of money, debt, interest, growth, inequality, oppression. We can't defer to the so-called experts. Neither, on the other hand, can we give in to despair. Welsh philosopher Raymond Williams says it well, to be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than despair convincing. I'm going to say that one again. To be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than despair convincing. On a similar note, some now nameless wise person said that despair is an insult to the future. So our liberation and our future requires us to imagine a new thing. The very meaning of the word economics can help us here. It comes from two Greek words, meaning the management of the hearth or the home, a profoundly moral and very straightforward task. So I offer a dare, dare to step out into the murky territory of money, finance, and banking. Join some of us who are there already. Claim our place there and start talking about the public good. It's clear that one thing the common good requires is relief from what is sometimes called debt slavery and what is seeming just like that to more and more people. We've talked about some of the ways of approaching this, dealing in community with debt, buying it up and refinancing it at low or no interest rates, addressing the most egregious practices in predatory lending by payday lenders, credit card companies, and colleges and companies that make a profit off of student debt, Supporting projects that buy up debt from debt collectors to forgive it and looking for other ways to, and places to support debt jubilee. There are also steps we can take to counteract the growing gap between rich and poor. In families, social networks, and communities, there are many opportunities for income sharing. As individuals and institutions with investments, we can think about how our assets can be used not just for wealth creation, but for community impact. In our wider communities, we can support projects and policies that narrow the gap between rich and poor. So to build up the incomes of the poor, we can support, in addition to debt relief, ways include raising the minimum wage and lowering the cost of necessities, such as transportation, housing, education, and health care. To restrain the accumulation of excessive wealth, we might look at the city of Portland, Oregon as a model for one idea. They recently passed an ordinance that adds a tax to corporations whose CEOs make more than 100 times that of their, the average of their workers. In the 1960s, this was about 20 to 1 average nationwide. It's now over 300 to 1. There's a surprising amount that can be done at the local level. And it's worth noting that cities are becoming hubs of innovation in policies around economic security and climate justice. Some decisions, however, still require action at the federal level. Tax policy is the most obvious, since that's a direct way to address income inequality. Remember that 91% tax rate on incomes over 250,000 in the 50s? There are other tax possibilities, ending preferential tax treatment for wealthy hedge fund managers, the idea that's sometimes called a Robin Hood tax, the financial transaction tax, that takes a tiny little bite out of every computerized transaction on the financial markets as a way to discourage making money from money 
without putting anything into the real economy. All of these things are totally worth doing. If you aren't already involved, I hope you get involved in some of them. And yet there's more. And this requires us to really, 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 really imagine a new thing. Trying to pu pull drowning people out of the water downstream needs to be done. But as we do this, some intrepid community members need to start blazing a path through the brambles and thickets that obscure what's going on upstream to make way for us to get to the source. And I think that that source is all about money. If something is baked into a system, we need to be thinking about a new recipe. So let's expand our horizons even more and stretch those faith muscles. Here's a few things to keep an eye out for. Sovereign money. This is the idea that the government can create and spend money directly into the economy. It's been done before. We mentioned in the US and in Canada. It can be done again. Now we've tried different ways. Here's a one minute history of finances in the US. Um, the first bank of the United States, chartered in 1791, followed the pattern of the Bank of England a privately owned central bank with the authority to loan money to the government. In 1832, Andrew Jackson ran on a populist campaign platform and didn't renew the bank's contract, the central bank. Then followed decades without a central bank. Lincoln introduced greenbacks in the Civil War as government created money. And small banks rose and fell. After a series of financial panics, including a really big one in 1907, agreement started to coalesce around the need for a central bank again. The big question was, who would control it? Now, I'm not a big fan of conspiracy theories, but this story is pretty compelling. In 1910, a group of private bankers arranged a top secret meeting to plan for a central banking system in which they would have sole control over the money supply. They rented a private train car. They pulled down the shades. They only used their first names. I mean, it's really quite a story. Um, one of their members, Frank Vanderlip, president of the National City Bank of New York, was candid about the need for secrecy. He said, discovery, we knew, simply must not happen, or else all our time and effort would be wasted. If it were to be exposed publicly that our particular group had got together and written a banking bill, that bill would have no chance whatever of passage by Congress. Well, they kept their secret. This was the plan with a few modifications that created the Federal Reserve in 2013. Now we think of the Federal Reserve as a public entity, but it's not. All the 12 regional Federal Reserve banks are private for-profit corporations. The New York Fed, representing Wall Street, heads the system. The directors of the 12 banks choose the board that chooses the committee that determines the monetary system for the country. Following the Great Recession of 2008, Federal Reserve Board members were tied to, here's a big one, four trillion in loans to their own banks. It's not surprising that this led to a period of record bank profits at the same time that the average worker saw their wages decline and the economy on Main Street ground to a standstill. It doesn't have to be this way. That was policy. That was a law that was passed in Congress in 1913. Be on the lookout for efforts to legitimize government creation of money through spending it directly into the economy as was done through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation during the Depression and World War II. And look for efforts to redesign the Federal Reserve to separate it from the private banks and make it more truly representative of the interests of the people. Another initiative to pay attention to, and this is what I'm really excited about, is the movement for public banking. In the public banking model, we put our municipal or state funds into a public institution, which will keep both the capital and the interest in-house for use on behalf of the public good. 
It's such a sensible idea, but so different from what we experience that it's hard to even get our minds around it. What would it mean to keep our taxes and public money at home working for us instead of sending them to Wall Street and then having to float municipal bonds to borrow back at interest? It's kind of sensible. So did you know, did you know that the only state in the country that came through the recession of 2008 unscathed was the one state in the country with a public bank? North Dakota, North Dakota, populist uprising in 1919. Um, I could talk a lot about that. Did you know that 267,000 voters in LA voted in November for a public bank? It wasn't enough to win the referendum. They only got 40%. But it was quite an accomplishment for a four-month effort by a group of unpaid grassroots volunteers. So these were young activists who had been part of the fossil fuel divestment movement. They'd run a successful campaign to get LA to pull its money out of fossil fuels, and they had no place to put the money. And Seattle has had a similar situation. Did you know that there's a regional effort to establish a public bank in Philadelphia, with one of the leaders being a guy who's been working with city council for decades with support in city council and in the commerce department. Did you know that the current governor of New Jersey run, ran on a platform that included the establishment of a public bank and that an academic study of the potential of such a bank came out with very, was overwhelmingly positive? I'm excited by the potential of campaigns around public banking to engage ordinary citizens in the big economic questions about who should be controlling our money and for whose benefit. I would love to have a referendum where I could ask my neighbors, hey, do you think our money should stay in Philadelphia or do you think it should go to Wall Street? What do you think? If you had a choice, which would you choose? That's just such a great opportunity to talk about those big issues. There are other ideas to watch out for and lend support to. Proposals for non-bank public, non-profit public banking for individuals not just through credit unions, but through post office banking, which we did in the past in the US and many other countries do, or perhaps individual accounts at the Federal Reserve. We can also work on preparedness, developing legislative proposals now so that when the next crash comes, and it's due soon, they're about every 10 years, we have a plan in place not just to bail out, but to buy out failed banks and maybe fossil fuel companies while they're at it and run them in the public interest. Many of the other ca causes that we work for so passionately are severely constrained by lack of resources. Housing, health care, food security, education, employment at a living wage, transition to a green economy. We're pitted against each other in a context of scarcity. What if the model that we take as a norm, with money as a scarce privately managed commodity, is not the only possibility? So let's dare to imagine a new thing and start talking about money not as a source of profit for some and debt for many, but as a public utility. Well, I've just painted a very big picture, and big pictures can be overwhelming. How do we translate these concepts into a framework that helps guide us? I've indicated where a path toward a new thing might lie, but it's not well trod, to say the least. In reality, we'll be making the path by walking it. It always makes sense to take steps toward greater integrity, toward closer alignment with our values, from where we stand. It, the only alternative really is standing still. And taking small steps of integrity is infinitely preferable to doing nothing at all. Yet it helps to have that big picture in mind, to orient us toward the direction we'll be moving in, and to remind us that we're not done when, we're f when we've taken all the individual and comfortable steps. So I hope we can keep these big 
you keep in mind these big and central issues, those of who controls our money and for whose benefit, and not stop moving until these issues are central and palpable and alive in any conversation or plan of action around economics, money, and debt. As members of a faith community, we have strong shoulders to stand on. Jesus expelled the merchants and money changers from the temple, accusing them of turning it into a den of thieves. A handful of early friends saw the problem with stunning clarity. I'm gonna give you some quotes here. William Penn lamented in 1668 that the sweat and tedious labor of the farmer, early and late, cold and hot, wet and dry, should be converted into the pleasure of a small number of men is so far from the will of the great governor of the world, it is wretched and blasphemous. John Bellers wrote, um, more briefly, 30 years later, of the labor of the poor being the minds of the rich. John Woolman contended in his plea for the poor, 1774, and I paraphrase, that it isn't right for poor people and animals to work long hours and tire themselves out so that others might have luxuries that only separate them from God. It's John Woolman at his best. Reformers of the 19th century advised us to get on with it. Lucretia Mott, never one to mince words, told us to bring your religion right into your politics, right into your commerce. In the 1960s, Kenneth Boulding not only talked about Spaceship Earth, but reminded us that, and I'm quoting him here, anyone who believes exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world is either a madman or an economist. And at the beginning of this century, Keith Helmuth offered a vision of money that illuminates a pathway toward liberation. We all need access to money. And in that sense, it's like air. Money is not a personal possession. It is a public service, a social good. Money is a feature of the social commons. In conclusion, I'd like to gather up some thoughts about that pathway toward liberation for us as debtors, lenders, and citizens. As debtors, we can work toward liberation from debt slavery as we take on that which we can change in our personal affairs, standing up to the seduction of consumerism and immediate gratification. We can work toward liberation from guilt as we realize that much of the situation we find ourselves in is not of our making or our fault. And we can li work toward liberation from isolation as we reach out in our communities, both to get help for ourselves and to band together with others to challenge oppressive predatory practices and the systems that maintain them. As lenders, we can liberate ourselves from a narrow understanding of investment. At its heart, investment just means putting resource into something in hopes for a return. And we invest in many ways and places. We invest in our bodies in the hopes that they will carry us well into old age. In people, our families, our children, our friends and colleagues. In our communities of place, of faith, of common interest. In our soil, that it might be rich and productive in our infrastructure, transportation, energy grids, water systems, houses, appliances, with the hope of getting the best value over the longest time, in our work and vocations, in our values and how we vote and the social causes we work for. They're really all of one piece, all part of deciding to how to put the resource, our resources into what's important to us with an eye toward our values and an eye toward the future. It makes sense for our money decisions to fit right into that same picture. As investors, we can also work toward liberation from isolation as we find ways to put our individual and group access to use in ways that increases security for everyone. As citizens, 
I think the biggest libera liberation may come from our fears that keep us small, our unwillingness to imagine that we could make a difference, our comfortable belief in our own insignificance. We have an opportunity to gather up the courage, courage that's the heart, first of all, to imagine a new thing, then to throw ourselves into the wholehearted quest for right relationship in this as in all aspects of our lives, and then to step boldly, if quaking, into the public arena to speak up and act on our fullest understanding of what integrity requires of us. Wow, that's it. So thank you so much for your attention. It was a blessing to be with you this evening. Let's see what we can do. That's the kind of enthusiasm we need. We need more people. And I'm sure we're going to get some, but I think it would be wonderful if you're willing to do so to um, see what kind of questions or comments your uh, provocative remarks have brought forward. Do people have questions? And if you do, wait for the microphone because we're uh, recording this and live streaming it. And if you hold the microphone the way I am right near your lips, um, everyone will be able to hear your question or comment. Hi. Uh, that was a really wonderful talk. Thank you. I, um, yeah, I especially uh, resonate with the the theme of imagination, which is um, something I explore in many ways in my own life. Um, I also wanted to to ask you about um, student debt in particular, which you you touched on uh, briefly, but. Um, as uh, somebody who has a fair amount of it myself, um, relatively manageable, thankfully, um, and hopefully possible to pay off, thanks in large part to the job I have here with Pendle Hill. Um, but you know, it it has been an enormous stress on my my life, and I know it's and even even more so for many others. Um, so I, I wonder what thoughts you may have about. Um, both both that uh, crisis at large and how it might be dealt with, and and um, also in terms of you know the the practicalities of dealing with debt on an individual level, you know, right. for for right. specific yeah. students. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, and and um, in sorry, th you know, this is a several part question, but. Um, In relation to that, I mean, I, I wonder what um, I don't know if if you have if you have thoughts on what life might look like on an individual level, um, liberated from debt from the si the sorts of systems you you described. If that makes sense. Woo. <laughs> Sorry, and yeah, you can yeah. answer any any yeah, of those yeah, three yeah. or none of them. Yeah, or yeah. Okay. As you, okay. As you like. Well, I remember the first time I was in a group where somebody of middle age said that her family, she and her partner, had bought up their, their child's student debt and renegotiated at a lower rate of interest. And I thought, oh my god, I had never heard of that before. But people are looking for places to invest, right? You know, do you put your money in Wall Street? Do you put your money in your child's stu student debt? I mean, so there's, I, I just think that it's really interesting. I think it's a really interesting question that faith communities could take on too. Where is our investment going? Are there people who are struggling with debt that we could, we could renegotiate those, um, their rates of interest in a way that would make things work better for them and would give us some return? We haven't quite figured out how to liberate ourselves completely from that interest, but that's one way of thinking about it. I'm not really up on the um, public policy implications. I know that there's been a lot of, of back and forth 
it's at the federal level about how to handle debt and what to forgive and there have been there has been work that's been done around some of the really worst um, for-profit colleges that that went into higher education with an intent of making money off of student debt my guess is that that's probably the minority of people so so yes there's things to do and I don't I can't give you more specific policy things about that um, well, you know, it's like living with living without. It's hard in the in the present and in the future. Like, like in the future, it's so interesting to think about how we could establish our security without interest. We really could. Like, social security is a system that doesn't depend on interest. It depends on the the um, ta taxes from people who are working in the present to pay for the people who are older. Taxation doesn't require interest. So there's ways, it's just, it's like, it's like, it really feels like it's a liberatory quest to get our minds around the possibility of doing things without interest. Spending money directly into the economy by the government doesn't require interest. We just, we, we can't quite imagine that. But in terms of what to do in the present, I think community is a really big thing. I think people, looking for opportunities to put their money into their communities rather than sending their money far away with hopes for a return is really interesting and seeing that that's a that's mutually beneficial uh, credit unions i mentioned credit unions credit unions are, are institutions are kind of financial microcosms where sometimes you're a borrower and sometimes you're a lender with your neighbors so those are the kinds of institutions that you can support and and those other local ones those um Local currencies, time banks, there are other interesting possibilities to explore, but I wouldn't want those to be in, um, instead of really looking at the, big, at the big picture. So it's like if that helps motivate you to address the big picture, I think that's a really good way to go. Um, let me just stick my nose in there for a minute. Uh, two things that occur. One is that you may be familiar if you live in this immediate area that media itself, um, Transition Town Media, has a time bank. Um, not anymore? Oh, well, okay. I'll look to Swarthmore then. Okay. And the other is. Um, it seems I ought to put in a plug for an upcoming program here at Pendle Hill that I think touches on an area that you spoke about, which was the systematic um, arranging of systems that would prevent the accumulation of wealth by people of color in this country. The GI Bill not working for those people, the system of redlining and so forth to keep people from being able to invest in housing. Uh, Melkor Hall, who has been here for another workshop, is going to be leading a workshop called Aiming for Justice, Reparations, Race, and Right, uh, and right Paths. Um, that's going to be focusing on the racial wealth gap and various efforts that are underway that include the buying up of debt of leaders among the black community so that they're freed to be able to do the activism that they've been undertaking mm -hmm. and, and other ways that we can use our money as European descended people to in some ways make reparations even if it's not at the macro level but that discussion is going to be February 10th through the 14th, so I would encourage people to pick up a flyer and take a look at it. Thank you very much. I think it's very clear and broad uh, what you've been uh, speaking with us about for the past hour. I think that uh, uh, at the core of it is the imagination. I think that you're absolutely right about that, that the ability to imagine something different than what we are saddled with now is the first step towards developing anything that is different than what we have. And towards that end, I was wondering how you could see uh, Quaker organizations 
uh, whether the yearly meetings or FCNL or American Friends Service Committee being able to influence or to implement changes or um, say join with other faith communities to uh, to make a difference okay so um, we have an interesting opportunity to influence the Friends Committee on National Legislation since they ask every two years for feedback from Quakers throughout the country about legislative priorities and it would be truly wonderful if people could talk about the importance of these issues to FCNL in any monthly meeting that you're in because FCNL is does not free to do legislative work without a sense from the wider community that this is important. So what are the economic systems? What are the monetary systems that support the other values that FCNL works on so hard? I just read um, a new book on Quakers in the Economy. There was a chapter on FCNL and it basically said we have busted our butts since 1949 and what we've gotten is stemming the tide of some of the worst things. And, um, and it's good that, that that has happened, but I think, that, I think that that organization just needs to feel backed by its wider community to go after really big questions about how the economy is structured. Um, what was the first question? He said, on the yearly meeting, well, we've had really interesting, this is some beginning, some, some very interesting conversations in the yearly meeting about what to do with our investments and how can we leverage the fact that we do have some wealth in a way that isn't just trying to increase that wealth, but is trying to think about the communities that we're embedded in and the needs that are all around us. So I th it feels to me like that conversation is just getting started. Um, I don't have anything to say about AFSC, but, um, and our meetings, I think our meetings can really, I would love to see our meetings think, I guess I mentioned that already, think about, about really local, locally and individually, the potential of, of putting some of our money into that kind of addressing of debt. Just to follow up with that, though, what about Friends Fiduciary Corporation, in which most of the Quaker organizations, including Pendle Hill and Philadelphia yeah. Yearly Meeting, have investments? I think most of our organizations at least have part of their endowment so influencing, in that. So yeah. influencing Friends, Friends Fiduciary is similar to influencing FCNL. They need, they need grassroots pressure to change. It was... It was um, requests for meetings to start the Green Fund that was what allowed them to set up a fund that was um, that excluded fossil fuels so that if people said we want a fund that invests in our communities, we want a community impact fund in Friends Fiduciary, they will respond. They're, they're not likely to take the initiative, but they will respond. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, two things, one is I wanted to offer you another quotation to put in your collection of, um, from um, my first employer who was a, a founder of a creative group problem solving consulting firm called Synectics. His name was George Prince and uh, he used to issue what we called exhortations. Um, um, and one of them was, don't justify pessimism as realism. And um, the uh, second thing I wanted to say was that throughout your talk, I kept um, seeing the parallels between your work and mine, which I know you know is about shifting the paradigm of what is c referred to as education, um, but it's really compulsory schooling um, and that led me to thinking about one of the most influential books that I read uh, which is Joel Barker's book uh, Paradigms um, and the, what I see you doing is trying to shift the paradigm of how we yeah. um, view money and everything um, and as Barker pointed out, 
paradigms are our mental model of the way things are. And one of the effects of paradigms is that they filter out any data that contradicts those paradigms so that we don't even see it sometimes, let alone can we believe. So how could you possibly get a job without a college degree? Or you have to go to school to learn are examples of the school paradigm. Um, and another point that he made, and this is my kind of last comment to you, um, was that uh, paradigms are almost always shifted by outsiders, the non-experts. Mm. And he gives examples of, uh, particularly from the world of technology, of paradigms that were shifted by outsiders. Um, for example, the rotary telephone was invented by the wife of an undertaker. Um, her husband was one of two undertakers in a small Midwestern town. And um, the other guy got all of the new referrals. And she kind of wondered why. This was back in the days when there was a town operator who was the information person. And if somebody called and said, I need an undertaker, they went to uh, this woman's preferred. And so she realized that the only way to help her husband get more business was to change the system. And so she invented the rotary phone hmm. and replaced the um, town operator. And one thing led to another. So you're trying to shift, um, you're trying to shift the paradigm. Yeah. Who are the outsiders? That would be us. And um, I, I I think that once you reach a certain age and stage in life, it's easier to consider new paradigms, to think outside the paradigm, because you're not caught up in all of the fear that's around living outside the paradigm. But uh, the other end of the age spectrum, not the end, um, but young people, particularly 20-somethings, are well known to be the inventors in history. Um, Particularly when they're not saddled by college uh, debt. <laughs> well, or on the other hand, like um, opposition to the Vietnam War, it was largely fueled by those who were facing the draft, mm. um, which I think is one of the reasons why we don't have more opposition to war from today's youth because they're not worried about being drafted. Um, so the pressure is on them. And what I would like to offer you, and if you haven't already considered it, is how to gain access to that population because uh, I think they would be highly motivated to help come up with ways to uh, support what you're suggesting. Yeah, it looks like we're going to be doing a summer program for, for young people on the topic of money this summer here at Pendle Hill. So, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> social media is what you wanted to do. Social media was the, was the last comment of our commenter here. Uh, I guess I want an uh, explanation. When you talk about buying up debt, um, what would that mean, like for someone like Michael? Say he owes sixty thousand dollars mm. on his college yeah. loan. So w would that mean that we, among us, accumulate sixty thousand dollars, pay off the bank, and then set up a different relationship with Michael so that he has to pay a lower interest rate to us who have? put up the money? Yeah. Is that how that would yeah, work? Yeah, that would be a way to do it. Like, so then he would be paying interest at maybe 2 or 3% rather than 7 or 8%. So that's one thing that we could do am among ourselves exactly. to see exactly. who has 
student debt or anything. The yeah. other thing I guess I wanted to just comment on is um, I was on a personnel committee here at one point. We tried to get we tried to get dental insurance, and one of the issues was none of the younger people wanted to <laughs> wanted to pay because they didn't have any dental expenses, and there were the rest of us who were getting crowns and all kinds of stuff. You know, and so I think we have to change our thinking about shared shared responsibility. Like I guess in some of the Amish communities or whatever, like the insurance is your community that right, people are going right, to take right. care of each other. Right. And in a way, that's another thing about shifting the paradigm. We're, we're so hyper individualized. And like retirement has moved from a common responsibility to an individual responsibility. So a lot of our economic our choices around finances have become much, much more individualized. And how can we spread them back out to become more part of, of community? conversations. One more question. I saw another hand. Uh, you've had your three. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your talk, Pamela. I, I really appreciate your ability to get us stimulated and thinking about money and our relationship with it. Um, and the, the way we relate to money uh, troubles me a great deal. Um, I'm part of the problem, and, and I'm very aware of that. And, and I'm wondering how we can get ourselves out of some of the places we've been stuck. And one example I would give would be in our very own Central Philadelphia Monthly Meeting, uh, where uh, a lot of our finances are tied up in endowments lots and lots of money and endowments. We allow ourselves to utilize the interest. And of course, interest is made off the backs of the poor people who work for the companies that we're invested in. Um, but because of the terms of the endowments or because of our fears about the future and our own sustainability, we don't allow ourselves to use our endowment money. So essentially, we're hoarding a whole bunch of money. Uh, that troubles me. Uh, could you address how you would think about that? Well, you know, you can think about it similarly with nonprofits, not, I mean, with philanthropies, that they have big endowments and they give away, like they have to give away, I think, a minimum of 5%. And, and so a lot of times the way that the way their thinking goes is, well, we'll put our, the, other, the other money into whatever will make the most interest and then we'll give away the 5%. But people are starting, there's a growing movement among philanthropies to say, well, what about that 95%? Like, does it make sense for me to put 95% into fossil fuels that make a really great investment and then spend my 5% on clean water? Not so much. So how do we, um, how do we think about how to leverage the 95%? And we may not be ready to say, let's spend down our endowment, but a shorter term strategy would be to let's, let's, let's think about having where that money is be aligned with our mission, with our values. And that's one of the things that I'm excited about, about this idea of community impact. Let's put our money into community impact projects that do still pay interest. We haven't, we haven't liberated ourselves entirely from that interest, but we're taking a step in thinking about, about the principle, aligning the principle with our values as well as the interest. I, do, I don't think it's easy, and I think that we have to have a lot of talk. We do have to talk with each other a lot, and we have to, again, talk as much as we can with our values right there present in the room. Thank you, Pamela. Let's have a round. And if you have additional questions, um, Pamela is going to be in the foyer uh, with uh, the Pendle Hill pamphlet, a copy of her new book, One But Not For Sale, and uh, copies of Towards Right Relationship with Finance with the longer subtitle that I never remember the order of. Debt, interest, debt, interest growth, and security. It's a mouthful. Uh, thank you for a very stimulating talk this evening, and I feel fired up to 
follow through with your suggestions. Great, thank you so um, much. They're outlined really thoroughly in the book. Um, so if you missed a couple of points, I think they are covered in more depth uh, there as well as some new thoughts that we've had this evening. I would invite you to enjoy refreshments out in the foyer to have further conversation among yourselves. We have to set the room up for um, meeting for worship tomorrow morning. For those of you who are live streaming, you will get the, uh, right on your screen, you will have the uh, setup of the additional resources. So we don't have to show that here. Great. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Please enjoy further conversation out in the hallway.